Welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, bringing the tales and stories of the ancient Celts to your fireside. Episode 2, Let Battle Commence. Hello, welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. I'm Gary. And I'm Ruth. And we've got a packed show for you today with some news and listener feedback at the end of the show and part two of the Book of Invasions. Now for some news and views. This podcast has been released on St David's Day, so happy St David's Day to all those Welsh who are listening. Absolutely. Happy St David's Day, guys. Um, I've been doing some interesting research about Wales recently and um, I've been looking at their emblems. Did you know that the leek and the daffodil are both emblems of Wales, but they share the same name? Seninan, I think. Excuse my pronunciation. But um, apparently they share the same name. And the, the um, daffodil only came into being, really, was brought in by the Victorians. But I never managed to find out why a leek is an emblem of Wales. So if anybody knows, please, could you let me know? No, I don't know either. No. And I, I knew about the leek, but I didn't know about the daffodil. Yes, yeah. Um, The other thing I wasn't able to find out either, um, and I'd really like to know if there's any Welsh people out there who could tell me, why is the red dragon an emblem of Wales? On the subject of Welsh celebrations, I found a notice the other day that the Eisteddfod this year, which is the Welsh celebration of verse, poetry and other bardic things, is going green. They're holding it in Cardiff city centre and it's going to be accessible by by rail and... uh, Cool. What do they call that? Oh, buses, that's those things. <laughs> those things with wheels on them, lots of people. That's the ones, that's, that's the ones, ones yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. So uh, basically they're going to go and reduce the pollution, which is cool, which is that's cool. That's excellent, yeah. There is a controversy, though. Um, really? And that is that in 1950, the well, whatever the ruling council is for mm-hmm. Ice for die, introduced a rule that said that all the performances had to be in Welsh, that it's to promote the Welsh language. Right. But this year they're doing a version of Verde's Requiem which is going to be in Latin. Well, that's interesting. So interesting to see what that turns mm. out. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to see what people say afterwards. Yeah, Because right? exactly. I think I think the Welsh are very proud that, that, that their Rai Stefford is actually in Welsh, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. And you were finding out something about St Piran, weren't you? Ah, uh, yes, yes. On um, March the 5th, it's St Piran's Day, and he's the patron saint of Cornwall. Um, he's he's quite a funny fellow. Uh, one of my favourite stories about him is that he liked he liked to tipple, and he actually died whilst drunk. Um, he was looking into a well and actually fell into it. Excellent. So, <laughs> okay, now there's a true Celt. <laughs> um, going back to emblems, I've also been looking at emblems of Cornwall. Sure. And one of them is the chuff, uh, which used to live on the cliffs in Cornwall. Was quite. Oh, that's some kind of bird, yeah. Yes, yeah. It's okay. a relative of the jackdaw. Ah. And uh, it was white, once a common sight on Cornwall's cliffs, but, that, but was actually wiped out. And recently, they've just, been, they've just reintroduced it, so let's hope they continue breeding. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And another question about emblems. People of Cornwall, why are violets associated with Cornwall? I couldn't find anything, so if you could let me know on the website, that'd be really helpful. Sure, a good call. Moving on to our story, a brief reminder of what happened in the last episode. We heard how the children of Danu came to Ireland in clouds of mist, and the Fearbolg sent their mighty warrior Srang out to spy on them. He was met by Brais, champion of the Tuatha de Danann, and they discovered that each culture had totally different weapons. The children of Danu offered to share Erin with the Fearbolg, but the Fearbolg refused, and they both prepared to go to war. So this episode is episode two. Let battle commence. The sun climbed high above the misty air and slowly heated the land to a dry sizzle. The lush grass over the plain of Tura waved gently in the warm breeze as Ruath, red-haired warrior of the Fear Bolg, rode westward at all speed to challenge the young men of the Tuatha de Danann to a hurling match. 
The preparations for battle were progressing, and the young warriors of the two are, eager to make a name for themselves, agreed to the game. Now both sides gathered, an equal number of warriors on Moitura, armed with their fighting sticks, and the mock battle began. Three times nine hurlers of the Firbolg dealt many a blow on the legs and arms of the three times nine hurlers of the Tuahaded Nan. Their blows fell like rain until their bones were broken and bruised and they fell outstretched on the turf. And the match ended. Every one of them was killed. Six weeks of the summer, half the quarter had gone on the appointed day of battle. The hosts rose on that day with the first glimmer of sunlight, that midsummer's day. The painted, perfectly wrought shields were hoisted on the backs of brave warriors. The tough seasoned spears and fighting sticks were grasped in the right hands of heroes, together with the bright swords that made the duels dazzle with light as the shining sunbeams shimmered on the sword's graven grooves. So the firm, close-packed companies, moved by the compelling passion of their courageous commanders, advanced towards Moinia to give battle to Ahade. It was then that the Fyrbolg poet, Fadach, went forward in front of them to describe their fury and spread the report of it. He had raised up and planted firmly in the midst of the plain a pillar of stone against which he rested. This was the first pillar set up in the plain, and Fadach's pillar was its name thenceforth. And then Fadach in utter anguish wept floods of fervent melancholy tears and said, With what glory they advance! On Moinia they marshal with dauntless might. Tis the Twaha day that advance, and the fair bulg of the decorated blades. The red bath will thank them for their bloodied corpses. Many will be their gashed bodies after the visit to Moitura. Torn will be the host after parting with warriors. Countless heads shall be severed with vigour and courage. The Tuaha formed a compact, well-armed host, marshalled by fighting warriors and provided with deadly weapons and stout shields. Every one of them pressed on his brother with the edge of his shield, the shaft of his spear or the hilt of his sword, so closely that they wounded each other. The chiefs who went out in front of the Tuaha day on that day were Ogma, Midir, Bovderg, the Ankecht and Engabar of Norway. The women of the Shi, Bav the battle crow, Macha the head taker and the terrible queen, Morrigan, accompanied them. The Dagda began the attack on the enemy by cutting his way through them to the west, clearing a path for a hundred and fifty. At the same time, Kirb made an onslaught on the Tuahade and devastated their ranks clearing a path for a hundred and fifty through them. The battle continued in a series of combats and duels, till in the space of one day great numbers were destroyed. By the close of the day the Tuahade were defeated and returned to their camp. The Fearbold did not pursue them across the battlefield, but returned in good spirits to their own camp. They each brought with them into the presence of their king a stone and a head, and made a great cairn of them. The Tuahade set up a stone pillar called the Pillar of Edlio, after the first of them to be killed. Their healers then assembled. The Firbolg too had their healers brought to them. They brought healing herbs with them and crushed and scattered them on the surface of the water in the well, so that the precious healing waters became thick and green. Their wounded were put into the well and immediately came out whole. Next morning, Iachi, the High King, went to the well all alone to wash and bathe. As he was doing so, three of the healers of the Tuaha de Danan were scouting to discover the methods of the Fearbolg healers. Nearly there for us, and then we should be able to see the healing works of the Fearbolg. There stands a man alone by the waterfall, a warrior of noble mien. By the old ones, it's the Fearbolg king. Here, Key, and he bathes alone. Let's take this chance and challenge him to combat. Hold, king. We offer you contest this morning. What? Where did you come from? You must wait for me to get my weapons. If we wait, brothers, then you will return with a host, and he shall be lost. That we cannot allow. The fight must be now. Behind me, Eirke. I will fight these men in your stead. Come on, all of you. They raised their hands simultaneously, and fought till all four fell together. 
The Firabolg heard the clamour and came up after the struggle was over. They saw the dead men, and the king told them how they had come upon him, and how the solitary, unknown champion had fought with them in his stead. The Firabolg brought each man a stone to the well for him, and built a great cairn over him. On the second day, it was the turn of Sreng, Semnor, and Sithbrog, along with Kirb, to lead the Firbolg. They rose early in the morning. A flashing roof of shields and a thick forest of spears they made over them. The Dagda led the forces of the Tuahade on that day, and he went forth with his sons and brothers, for he was an excellent god. Each side then sprang at the other, Sreng, son of Sengan, began to dislodge the hosts of the enemy. The Dagda set to breaking the battalions and harrying the hosts, and dislodging divisions and forcing them from their positions. Kirb, son of Buan, entered the fray from the east, and slaughtered brave men and spirited soldiers. The Dagda heard Kirb's onset, and Kirb heard the Dagda's battering blows. They sprang each at the other. Furious was the fight as the good swords fenced, heroic the heroes as they steadied the infantry and answered the onslaughts. At the last, Kirb fell before the Dagda's battering blows. Sreng, Sengan's son, was pressing back the host from their places when he came on three sons of Kirb Raikas of the Tuahade and the three sons of Ordan. The enemy fell before him on every side and the fury of the combat grew behind him. After the fall of Kirb, the Fearbolg were driven into their camp. The Tuahade did not pursue them across the battlefield, but they took with them a head and a stone pillar apiece, including the head of Kirb, which was buried in the cairn of Kirb's head. The Fearbolg were neither happy nor cheerful that night, and as for the Tuahade, they were sad and dispirited. But during the same night, Fintan, the only person to have survived the flood, ancient and wise, came with his sons to join the Firbolg, and this made them all glad, for valiant were both he and they. In this cheerful mood, the morning of the third day found them. The signals of their chiefs roused them on the spacious slopes of their camping ground, and they began to hearten each other to meet danger and peril. Eachie the high king with his son Slinger the fair, and the soldiers and the chiefs of Kanachta came forth to join them. Sengan's three sons with the host of Koroi's province took their place at one side of the line. The four sons of Gun with the warriors of Iachi's province marched to the centre of the same army. Buan's sons, Eskar and Ekkon, ranged themselves with the men of Konchabar's province on the other wing. The four sons of Slinger with the host of the Goylian brought up the rear of the army. Round Iachi, the high king, they made a fold of valour of battle-scarred blood becrimsoned braves and the world's trustiest troops. The thirteen sons of Fintan, men proved in courageous endurance of conflict, were brought to where the king was. A flaming mass was the battle on that day, full of changing colours, many feats and gory hands of sword play and single combats, of spears and cruel swords and fighting sticks. Fierce it was, and pitiless and terrible, hard packed and close knit, furious and far flung, ebbing and flowing with many adventures. The fear bog marched boldly and victoriously straight westwards to the end of Moitura till they came to the firm pillars of valour between themselves and the Tuahade. The passionate Tuahade made an impetuous, furious charge in close-knit companies with their venomous weapons. They formed one mighty, gory phalanx under the shelter of red-rimmed, emblazoned, plated, strong shields. The warriors began the conflict. The flanks and the wings of the van were filled with grey-haired veterans, swift to wound. Aged men were stationed to assist and attend on the movements of those veterans, and next to those steady, venomous fighters were placed young men under arms. The champions and serving men were posted in the rear of the youths. Their seers and druids stationed themselves on pillars and points of vantage, plying their sorcery, while the poets took count of the feats and wrote down tales of them. As for Nuada, he was in the centre of the fight. Around him gathered his princes and supporting warriors with the twelve sons of Gabran. 
Thus they delivered their assault after fastening their bodies to rough-edged stones with clasps of iron, and made their way to the place appointed for the battle. At that moment Fathach, the poet of the Firbolg, came to his own pillar, and as he surveyed the armies to the east and west, said with the voice of prophecy, Swiftly advance the hosts clashing on Moynir with their restless might. Tis the Tuatha day that advance on the Firbolg of the blooded etched blades. The Firbolg will lose some of their brothers there. Many will be the bodies, heads and sliced flanks on the plain. But they fall on every side. Fierce and keen will be their onset. Death will surround them, heroes laid low by their impetuous valour. Thou hast subdued the Firbolg. They will die there by the side of their shields and their blades. I will not trust to the strength of anyone, so long as I shall be in the stormy Erin. I am Fatak the poet. Strongly has sorrow vanquished me. And now that the Firbolg are gone, I shall surrender to the swift advance of disaster. The furies and monsters and hags of doom cried aloud, so that their voices were heard in the rocks and waterfalls and in the hollows of the earth. For it was then that Nuada called upon the hosts of the Shi to fight at his side. It was like the fearful, agonizing cry on the last dreadful day when the human race will part from all in this world. In the host of the Tuatha day advanced the Dagda, Ogma, Alla, Brace, and Delbaith, the five sons of Elatha, together with Brace, grandson of Neat, the Fomorian, Engus, Ed, Keramad the Fair, Midir, Bovderg, Sigma, Labartach, Nuada the High King, Goban the smith, Lucre the joiner, Kredne the craftsman, Diankrecht the healer. There was also Engarbar of Norway, the three queens, Ere, Fotel and Bamba, and the three she, Bav, Macher and Morrigan. They fixed their pillars to the ground to prevent anyone fleeing till the stones should flee. They lunged at each other with their keen sharp spears till the stout shafts were twisted through the quivering of the victims on their points. The edges of the swords turned on the lime-covered shields. The curved blades were tempered in boiling pools of blood in the thighs of warriors. Loud was the singing of the spears as they cleft the shields. Loud the noise and din of the fighters as they battered bodies and broke bones in the rear. Boiling streams of blood took the sight from the grey eyes of resolute warriors. It was then that Brace made an onset on the Fearbog army and killed one hundred and fifty of them. He struck nine blows on the shield of Iachi, the High King, and Iachi in his turn dealt him nine wounds. Sengan's son, Sreng, turned his face to the army of the Tuahade and slew one hundred and fifty of them. He struck nine blows on the shield of the High King, Nuada, and Nuada dealt him nine wounds. Each dealt dire blows of doom, making great, gory wounds on the flesh of the other, till under their grooved blades and shields and spears, heads and helmets broke like the brittle branches hacked with hatchets wielded by the stout arms of woodsmen. Heroes swayed to this side and that, each circling the other as they sought opportunity for a blow. The battle champions rose again over the rims of their emblazoned shields. Their courage grew, and the valiant, virulent men became steadfast as an arch. Their hands shot up with their swords, and they fenced swiftly about the heads of warriors, hacking their helmets. For a moment they thrust back the ranks of the enemy from their places, and at the sight of them the hosts wavered like the water flung far over its sides by a kettle through excess of boiling, or the flood that like a waterfall an army splashes up over a river's banks, making it passable for the troops behind them. Clear a space, clear a space, you are dies fighting Shreng. We have taken thirty wounds apiece, Shreng. Are you ready to yield? Never! <sighs> Shreng has severed the king's arm. To me, warriors of Danu! I am here, my liege lord, to Saint Gabba of Norway. I heard the music of the swords and I hasten to your side, Nuada. Engaba. Dugda, my dear friend. Against two champions such as yourself, I can offer no battle. I shall withdraw. The Dugda came and stood over Nuada, and after the Tuahade had taken counsel, he brought fifty soldiers with their healers. They carried Nuada from the field. His hand was raised in the king's stead on a fold of valour, 
a fold of stone surrounding the king, and on it the blood of Nuada's hand trickled. The Tuatha maintained the conflict keenly and stoutly after their king was gone. The Dagda, Ogma, Alar and Delbe surged forward to attack Iachi. He was urging the fight, collecting and encouraging his captains, making close and compact the ranks of the soldiery, holding his fighting men firm and steadfast. The four brothers, in their search for Iachi, drove the hosts before them to the place where they heard him urging the fight. The four sons of Slenga met them and each struck at the other's shield. Their swords clashed and the conflict grew, and the edges of the blades cut gory wounds. The four sons of Slenga fell before the brothers. The four sons of Gun then entered the fray. Against them advanced Goban the smith, Lucraid the joiner, Diankecht and Engavar of Norway. Horrible was the noise made by the deadly weapons in the champion's hands. Those combatants maintained the fight till the four sons of Gun were slain. Iachi and his son, Slenga the Fair, now joined in the fray, and destroyed innumerable companies of the Tuatha After this long-continued effort, Iachi was overcome by a great weariness and excess of thirst. He then went out of the battle with a guard of one hundred of his soldiers. When the Tuatha druids and the Shining Ones saw how the King of Erin was suffering from a burning thirst, they hid from his eyes all the streams and the rivers of Erin till he came to the strand of Eirhael. Three sons of Nemed, son of Badrai, followed him, with a hundred and fifty men. They fought on the strand, and a number fell on either side. Eachi and the sons of Nemed met in combat. Venomous in battle were the sons of Nemed, and tried in fighting against odds was Eachi. They fought till their bodies were torn and their chests cut open with the mighty onslaughts. Irresistible was the king's onset as he ceaselessly cut down his opponents, till he and the three sons of Nemed fell. He is the first king of Erin who received his death wound in the Emerald Isle. Sad and weary, wounded and full of heavy reproaches were the Fyrbolg that night. Each one buried his kinsfolk and relatives, his friends and familiars and foster brothers, and then were raised mounds over the brave men, and stones over the warriors, and tombs over the soldiers, and hills over the heroes. After that, Sreng, Semni, and Sithbrug, the sons of Sengan, called a meeting for council and deliberation to which three hundred assembled. They considered what it was their interest to do, whether they should leave Erin, or offer regular battle, or undertake to share the land with the Tuahade. They decided to offer the Tuahade continued battle. But on the fourth and last day, the men of day got the upper hand, and the Firbolg were driven back. When there were but three hundred men left of the eleven battalions of the Fearbolg, and Sreng at the head of them, Nuada offered them peace, and their choice among the five provinces of Erin. And Sreng said they would take Kanachta, and he and his people live there and their children after them. It is of them Firdiad came afterwards that made such a good fight against Gocholin, and Eak son of Caerbrae that gave him his death. And that battle, that was the first fought in Erin by the men of day, was called by some the first battle of Moitura. Though Nuada did not die, he lost his right arm in battle. To the children of Danu, losing any body member results in losing the right to become king of Erin. Any form of physical blemish disqualifies a king from ruling. The children of Danu had to choose a new king. They chose Brace, the great and mighty warrior, to lead them. So the Tuahade Dinan took possession of Tivir, that was sometimes called Droim Cain, the beautiful ridge, and Lia Droim, the grey ridge, and Droim Nadeskan, the ridge of the outlook. All those names were given to Tivir, and from that time it was above all other places, for its king was the high king over all Erin. The king's wrath lay to the north, and the hill of the hostages to the northeast of the high seat, and the green of Tivir to the west of the hill of hostages. And to the northeast, in the hill of the Shi, was a well called Nemnach, and out of it there flowed a stream called Nith. And on that stream, the first mill was built in Erin. And to the north of the hill of the hostages was the stone, the Leafal, which used to roar under the feet of every king that would take possession of Erin. And the wall of the three whispers was near the house of the women that had seven doors to the east and seven doors to the west, and it's in that house the feasts of Tevere used to be held. 
And there was the great house of a thousand warriors, and near it to the south the small hill of the warrior women. In our next episode, The Rule of Brace, Brace finds it quite hard to rule to our day, the doctor gets hungry, and the Unkecht does some healing. And finally, some listener feedback. We've had a few emails, and they've been brilliant. Absolutely superb. We've had one from Celtic Fire Gem on the forums who said, love your podcast, and she's helped us solve a problem on the website. Thank you for that. Manani MacLear has pointed us to some tales from the Isle of Man that we can use in future episodes. And Morgana said, thank you for your excellent podcast. Long may it flourish. And she also suggested that we include a book list on the site. Again, brilliant idea. That's on the way. Thank you all of you. And news from our forums. Gunnerman asked whether we could include a brief resume of previous of the previous episode to bring listeners back up to speed with the story. Excellent idea. So we've done it and we hope that helped. Crafty Cat asked for the theme music to be a little shorter. That's a good idea as well. So we've done that. We've had a review for the last episode, which is absolutely superb. It was from Anne from the Anne is a Man blog, who's a podcast reviewer of scholarly podcasts. And he reviewed us and said some really nice things about our show, including that the tales are brought close to the listener by subtle dramatisation. We're going red here. We recommend his site if you're looking for some more good material. You can find a link to his site in the show notes. He mentioned it's hard to keep track of all the names. Well, that's a good point. Quick reminder to everyone then, names are all written down in the show notes in the order in which they appear. Hope that helps everyone get to grips with them. And finally, someone's tried to leave us a voice feedback on the site, but we didn't get it. Sorry about that. We're all excited for a while here. Drop us a line if you are having trouble with the voice feedback and we'll try and try and help you out. Thank you once again to everybody who's given us feedback. We found it really helpful. Absolutely. Um, and please continue to do so because it helps us help you. And we love it. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode. And until next time, Slon Gavoya. You've been listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, available from CelticMythPodShow.com. We hope you've enjoyed the show and will stay tuned for the next episode. You can send us a quick email or voice feedback by emailing either Gary, that's G-A-R-Y, or Ruth, R-U-T-H, at CelticMythPodShow.com. You can chat to us in the forums on our website. The show notes for this episode can also be found on the website. We'd like to say a special thank you to Kulan's Hounds, who provided us with a theme music for our show. You heard Hag Hole at the beginning and are listening to The Skylark now. You can find out more about this foot stomping band at www.sfhounds.com. And thanks again to Diane Arkinstone and Kim Robertson, whose music has been used for some of the incidental music in this podcast. You'll find links to their websites in our show notes.